Hudson. I'm a dermatologist. I, uh, I have a practice up in Castleton. I also have um, offices in uh, Kokomo and my offices, we have satellites in Anderson and um, Zionsville as well on the east side of Indianapolis. I started working as a dermatologist in 1997 after training at IU and University of Chicago. I have a specialist, uh, sort of a special interest in clinical research, and I do a lot of research on psoriasis, uh, psoriasis medications, eczema, eczema medications, um, and other sort of chronic inflammatory disease. But really the biggest part of what we do as dermatologists, and I think a lot of people don't understand this, the biggest part of what we do is chronic sun damage, chronic skin disease, and, and in this case, chronic illness in the skin. I think that people don't realize that uh, 25% of my day, no matter how much I specialize in something else, is still people who have chronic illness on their skin. And obviously what I'm talking about is chronic skin disease, uh, but there's a lot of internal uh, internal disease which, which causes skin issues as well. And we'll talk about this. I just have a few slides sort of to, to guide me and hopefully give you some information. And you know, as we, as we go along, if people do have questions, you're welcome to, to interrupt me, obviously. Um, all right, so chronic illness and aging. Aging is the main thing we see, the main changes. People ask me all day long, you know, how do I make myself look younger? What do I do to prevent this? And the biggest part of my job is looking at patients and saying, my job is to tell you normal or not normal. And this is a normal spot. This is a not normal spot. And, uh, you know, I always tell people, if I took a piece of your, a piece of your liver, it would look different than it did 15 or 20 years ago. So why shouldn't your skin look different? But people are always very concerned. And then we have to decide, is it a normal change or not a normal change? Um, and you look here on my list, there are many, many illnesses and many skin signs. So someone who has blood disease, they can have bruising, they can have what's called purpura. Uh, blood diseases can cause, you know, uh, you can have leukemia on the skin. There's lots of different skin signs of, uh, of internal disease. Cancer, of course, of course, internal cancer has all sorts of skin diseases and rashes and, um, you know, uh, what we call eczematous eruptions where itchy, you know, itch, itchy parts from the cancer. And then also, obviously, the treatment for cancer, the treatment for chronic disease causes rashes and side effects on the skin as well. Um, and the metabolic diseases like diabetes can cause pigment changes and things on the skin, signs that we see, which could be uh, representative of what's going on in the inside. You know, vitamin deficiency is another thing I wrote down. But really, any chronic condition, whether it's neurological or psychological or metabolical or cardiac, all these have uh, signs on the skin. The skin is, as you guys know, sort of a joke. The skin is the largest organ, you know, by weight in the body. But really what it is, is a sign to the outside of what's going on on the inside. So a lot of my training is, is based on, on that. As you get older, there are things we all see. We see thinning of the skin. We see decreased blood vessels, increased bruising, decreased sweating, increased healing, increased dryness and wrinkles, pigment changes, decreasing hair. Um, you know, they always say we, we lose hair where we want it, we gain hair where we don't want it. Um, and, and we see this, you know, and, and one thing I should say, you know, we, we see this in all skin types. We see it in skin types of fair skin, of pigmented skin, African-Americans, Caucasians, Asians, everyone has changes. Sometimes you see it more in lighter skin. Sometimes you see other changes more in darker skin. But uh, the main thing we see as you get older is changes which are reflective of the cells sort of getting tired and overly damaged by years of uh, sun exposure. This is one of my favorite pictures. I picked this picture up 20 years ago, probably. These are, these are two women who are the same age. The one on the left is a monk who has, has been inside her whole life. She never went outside, she was an internal. And then this woman also is an American Indian who has spent her whole life outside. And that's just, they both have skin with pigment, Asian type pigment, but you can see the difference. One is almost no signs. They're both in their, uh, what, the, what the article said originally was they're both in their late 80s. So you can see this woman, no one would say, oh, I can't believe she's 80, but this woman, people would definitely say that. So that's just a sign of how the sun and the stress of life, I guess, could lead to signs of aging. Um, skin cancer is a big part of what we do in dermatology, a big part of uh, aging with the skin, basal cells are the very common kind, squamous cells we'll talk about. Melanoma, of course, is the scary kind. That's the kind that really up to one person dies every hour from melanoma. So we do wanna, um, you know, we do wanna make sure we see it. Actinic keratosis is a fancy word for precancers, <clears throat> by far the most common diagnosis we deal with in dermatology. And there's many other sort of skin cancers, but 
really the ones that are, are common are the ones I just mentioned. Actinic keratosis, these are the ones that, um, that, are, that, are, that are precancers. Uh, sometimes we call them early skin cancers or squamous cells. They're red, they're tender, they're crusty. We say they're sort of gritty, usually on the sun exposed skin. So the head, the neck, the back of the hands and about 65% more of the time it's on the left side and the right side because of people driving cars. So people are surprised by that, but sometimes people will walk in the office and I can tell they grew up in London because all their sun damage is on the right side. Uh, and they drove on the right side their whole life. Uh, and about 30% of these will become, will become skin cancer. What do they look like? Here's some pictures. So you can see over here, we, these are circled, they're red, they're scaly. Over here, they're again, red, scaly. And here's a close up of one. It's crusty, it's red, it catches your finger. Often they're tender as well. But these are spots that if we don't treat could become a problem. What are the risk factors? Light skin, blue or green eyes, blonde or red hair. These are all risk factors. Uh, living in sunny climate. If you have immunosuppression, this is chronic illness. We've heard so much about immunosuppression the last two years with COVID. If you have any medicines or any diseases which affect your immune system, we know what it does. People, it's very common, even with chronic illness such as you know chronic cancers, these affect your immune system and that can make you at higher risk for growths, growths such as actinics. Um, outdoor occupation, of course, greater than 50 years old. If you have a history of skin cancer, then of course you're higher risk for this uh, as well. We treat these with freezing, that's what cryosurgery is. You know, people call it the torch of death when they walk in my office. Oh, you got the torch of death out. Because we freeze these like you freeze warts and it hurts a little bit, but they blister up, they come off and that prevents these from becoming skin cancer. Curatage means scraping it away. We use some creams like a topical chemotherapy called fluorouracil, uh, other creams as well. Uh, phototherapy is a, a light therapy we put on top of these. We treat the whole head or the whole face and that's to prevent these from becoming uh, skin cancers. Let's see. So topical 5 f uses cancer and, and this actually can get you pretty inflamed. That's what this is showing you. These are not, I'm sorry, I know sometimes if you're not used to looking at skin pictures, these can be sort of creepy, but this is actually a reaction to the medicine that we want. It's a reaction to the medicine showing that every spot that gets red with the cream is potential cancer. So here the guy's just doing his mid face, here he's doing his whole face, and here he's doing this part as well. But he's doing the same amount in these two people, but only one is getting awe because this one, only the red spots are precancer, and here the whole place is precancer. Um, and basal cell, of course, is the most common kind of skin cancer. Millions a year, 3.6 million a year, that's data from 2022. Lighter skin, again, is more common. Many forms, we can, you know, that, that's more of forms under the microscope. They can be nodules. We'll see a picture here. They can be like a nodule like that. They can be uh, flat and red. There's different ways they can look, but part of our uh, training, part of our training in dermatology is to, is to know that this is, again, this is a normal spot. This is not a normal spot. And I think that's, um, we look at this particular picture, this lesion here, is a, is a basal cell, is a skin cancer that if we don't treat, it'll slowly grow, eventually it can cause problems. It could bleed, it could invade tissue, so you do want to treat it. Here's close-ups, again, a nodule, has a little ulcer in the center, and you know they just bleed spontaneously. This one is called infiltrating, but it's more of a, you know, it's not really that, that classic ulcer or nodule, it's more of a red, purple plaque that you see, and they just People come in and they say, this doesn't feel right. And you can look at them and say, you don't have to be a skin doctor to know that's not a normal spot. And obviously squamous cell, this is a big one. This is a, again, sometimes I put together these talks and I forget that you're not in the, in the healthcare industry and they can be sort of gross, but you do see some pretty big skin cancers in our business. And my job is not to shock you, but to know that, again, I see this in people of all colors, all skin colors, but mostly in people that are, are lighter. Again, there's nodules and tumors, ulcers. It's usually considered ultraviolet induced. Um, sort of classically years ago, people would, there'd be arsenic. And so arsenic is still in some compounds, but it's been moved out and filtered out of most of our um, the chemicals we use today. It used to be in certain foods like salt that eight years ago, and people would get these cancers from eating arsenic. Uh, obviously, a lot of arsenic is fatal, but sort of slow arsenic over time would cause skin cancers. And then the wart virus. So a lot of us have had warts. It's very common. Certain wart virus, especially under the nails or on the fingers, 
have been associated with changing into skin cancer. So again, if you have a wart that's not going away, it's it's probably reasonable to get it get it checked. Um, and again, this goes along with chronic illness. And as you get older, the warts get older. And if they don't get treated, they could become a problem. Non-melanoma skin cancer, that's what it sounds, that's what the NMSC stands for. It's very rare they spread. Um, of course, that's that's you know what we talk about is could skin cancers or any cancer spread? These are very rare, but they do spread. Uh, but once you've had one skin cancer, the risk of another one in five years is 50% somewhere else. So it's very, it's very, uh, very important that someone has a skin cancer. We see them, we do routine skin checks pretty often. I, I will do it at three months, six months, and once a year for at least five years and look at everywhere in their skin to make sure there's no other uh, new spots. Um, and if you have the melanoma, which I'll talk about in a second, which is sort of the uh, more worrisome kind of cancer, that one is uh, more at higher risk as well once you've had the other kinds. So how do you avoid these? You avoid the sun between 10 and 4 p.m. Uh, you wear protective clothing, you wear wide brim hats. People that have seen me in my office, they just, they give me back my, <laughs> they give me back my spiel when they see me because they hear it so often. Um, you know, sunscreen, at least 15, ideally 30 or more. You wanna block UVA, UVB, and the sort of the newest thing in the last year is visible light. So. There's a lot of studies coming out in dermatology just in the last year showing that visible light, the light that we actually see out of light bulbs can actually cause some damage. And this is especially important in uh, people that are, have African-American skin because visible light is the kind of light that causes the pigmentation that a lot of men and women get on their forehead or their upper lip, uh, but they don't want it. So visible light is actually more destructive for skin color than we thought it was. So it's important now that when you get a sunscreen, you get a sunscreen that's a little thicker, it often will say on it, will cover visible light as well. And it's new, it's a new thing. And so sunscreens are just starting to say that, but you wanna look for that visible light as well as UVA and UVB. Sunscreen generally lasts about an hour, two hours if you're not sweating, three hours sometimes. So if you're gonna be outside, you're gonna be on the beach, you're gonna be playing golf. I know there's always golfers. Uh, they get a lot of sun and they should reapply whenever they can reapply their sunscreen, just think about it. Um, obviously no tanning and do self skin checks. Uh, the one thing I always said to patients, I got this time of year, I'm getting all these people that have gone on, on uh, spring break and they come in and they're sunburned or they're tan. And I, the first thing I always say is, did you forget your clothing? <laughs> because you can wear clothes in the sun. It's not against the rules in any country in this world to wear clothing. They make really nice temperature cool, sun protective clothing, sleeves, shirts, that you can wear and not get cooked. Um, and it, it seems, people often think it's, it's odd, but if you actually start doing it, you really get used to it and you stay, you stay safe. Melanoma, here's a picture. This is a sort of a classic, you know, what we call ABCD, asymmetry, irregular border, has multiple colors. It's a large diameter and it's uh, evolving, it's changing. So those are the ABCDEs of melanoma. Melanoma is the scary kind of cancer. Um, now, having said that, 90, 98% are cured right away. So 2% are not cured right away, but 98% are. But there's enough people that aren't cured that we still see, it, we still see uh, some bad signs. In 2022, they're expecting uh, 99,780 diagnosed with melanoma. It is very common. 2,000% increase since 1930. Part of that's because we're diagnosing them earlier and better. Part of it's because the ozone layer in the sky is much thinner, so we get more ultraviolet rays on our skin. Uh, part of it is the, the, the pathologists are much better at making the diagnosis. Um, 7,650 people are expected to die. That's, that's almost one person every hour in this country is expected to die from melanoma this year. And even this year, we've gotten such amazing new treatments uh, for melanoma. The last, the last seven, eight years have new miraculous immune therapy. People still are passing away from melanoma, usually because it spreads. It's the fifth most cancer, fifth most, most common cancer in the world. 50% uh, of current people less than 55 years old. That's why it's so, so worrisome. You know, most cancers are people older than 60 or 70. This one's younger. And it's the most common cancer in women between 25 and 29. Um, somewhat genetic, somewhat tanning beds. Women are much more likely than men to want to cook themselves and get that you know, good tan. I always say there's no such thing as a good tan or a healthy tan or a nice tan. 
And this, by the way, is another picture of a melanoma. Not as red as the other one, but still areas where there's less pigment, areas where it's irregular. So that's a sort of a scary mole. Um, this happened to be someone in an African-American. It was on the bottom of the foot. So when you see uh, African-American skin, the most common area we see this kind of skin cancer is the plant, the palm and the sole. You can get them anywhere, but palm and sole, and they're, if you don't catch them early, again, they can be, they can be pretty worrisome. Ultraviolet radiation is a risk factor. If you have lots of regular moles, more than 50 regular moles, that's a risk factor for melanoma. Dysplastic nevus syndrome is someone that has multiple funny looking moles. Um, it's sort of a syndrome where you get lots of funny moles and they all look funny. It's sort of scary because you look like you have lots of these cancers, but really you don't, you just have funny moles. Um, if you have, if you're born with a huge birth, like one of those babies you see with a, you know, 20 centimeter area this big is, is like, you know, covered in a dark brown or black, you know, birthmark. That's a, that itself has a risk of becoming a melanoma. If you've had a previous melanoma or skin cancer, you're a little high risk. Or if you're if you're first degree relative, like your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, even a grandparent, if they have melanoma, that puts you at a higher risk of, of melanoma. Um, I'm switching here a little bit. That was cancer. If you have questions, we'll talk about it when, when I'm over in a couple more slides. Um, but what do we do for skin maintenance? So you've you've you want to prevent cancer. We talked about sunscreens, that's on the list here. I think a lot of people know it's important to obviously cleanse your skin and cleansing your skin does more than just make you look better, feel better. Um, it removes it moves impurities. It removes obviously dirt, but it also helps refresh the turnover of the skin. So you get the freshest cells on the top of the skin. Uh, and I think that's important. Uh, emollients, uh, you know, a lot of people have very dry skin, ashy skin. And it's important that when you, uh, after you bathe, after you shower, you put on some sort of lotion or cream. Generally, I recommend creams because they're more, a little more thick. They're oil-based as opposed to water-based. But creams or lotions, put them on top of your skin when you're still a little bit damp, and that'll help seal in the water, and that'll help with your long-term skin maintenance. And then, of course, the sunscreen as well. Uh, a lot of those are combined. You can buy combined you know, lotions with sunscreen, especially for the face, and that is a great way to sort of protect yourself. Lots of companies, Cetaphil, Eucerin, too, that I put pictures of here, but there's there's lots of great companies of, of uh, different moisturizers. Um, let's see. So skin rejuvenation, people ask me about that. And here again, you can see someone, uh, and this is a picture that is not an actual patient that I met, it's just a picture I found. But you can see over time, if you do, you know, some procedures, uh, you, can, you can rejuvenate. This is, I think, exaggerated. I don't think people go from this sort of line wrinkles to this, but you can improve somewhat for sure. Um, but retinoids, vitamin A's, retinoids is another word for vitamin A creams. We use them a lot. Uh, it's really the basic, you know, how do we keep ourselves looking as young as possible? Retinoids, vitamin A creams, and sunscreen. Beta hydroxy acids, and then there's all these other things, Botox and fillers, things that I don't do much of, like I said, because I really specialize in, uh, in psoriasis and eczema. But there are estheticians, there are other uh, cosmetic dermatologists that really do specialize in, in um, you know, cosmetic skin rejuvenation. That's really all I have in terms of actual slides. Um, I know that a lot of people, when, when they talk to a dermatologist, often have questions about skin. Um, and I think that that's, uh, I'd love to take any questions if, if people do have them. Cellulitis is a, uh, you know, an infection that's considered a superficial infection of the skin um, where you get tender red uh, patches, like your whole legs. Usually in the leg, it gets very red, but it can be anywhere in the body. And it's, a, it's usually an infection, usually a strep infection, but it could also be a staph infection, a different kind of bacteria. Uh, and it, chronic illness, it, 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 it can increase your risk of getting cellulitis because, again, your immune system won't be as strong if you have chronic illness. So chronic illness yeah. will lead to things like that. So you're more likely to get cellulitis. Treatment, of course, is antibiotics, um, but you got to catch it early. If you follow some of the rules where you moisturize and you keep your skin healthy with, you know, cleansers and moisturizers, um, that will help keep the barrier strong in your skin. If you keep okay. your barrier strong, you're less likely to get uh, cellulitis. It's very important. Foot care, 
because people that have like athlete's foot, they get or dry skin on their feet. They get little cracks in the feet. The little cracks will let bacteria in. Uh, keep your feet clean. Keep good foot care. Maybe see a podiatrist. So in general, I didn't mention for chronic illness in general, you want things that keep you healthy in general, right? Exercise, right. healthy diet, you know, not yeah. smoking. You all know what, you know, you all know what you're supposed to do. It's just not easy to do it, right? But that's um, any chronic illness will be improved with the basic healthy living, healthy okay. eating, healthy, um, healthy exercise, things like that. Well, in general, you know, if you've had it for many years and it hasn't changed, it's usually not going to be a problem. Uh, ultraviolet light is anti-inflammatory. So we used to use it a lot for decreasing psoriasis or eczema because it works almost internally to decrease inflammation. We've really got a lot, uh, a lot new medicine, a lot of new medications for eczema the last couple of years, mm -hmm. which are revolutionizing the treatment. So the general rule, I wouldn't, I wouldn't differentiate African American skin and, and Caucasian skin in the sense I think that you always want at least a 15. So 15 will block 97% of the rays and a 30 will block 98% of the rays. So 15, 30 is probably what most people recommend, but 15 is really fine as long as you apply it and reapply it. Look at these companies now that are just coming out with ones that say visible light as well. Um, but UVA, UVB, visible light, but at least the number 15, ideally. You break down the wavelengths of light into different... Uh, numbers and there's ultraviolet a ultraviolet b infrared light and then there's what's called visible which is what we see blue light red light green light colors of the rainbow um, and we didn't <laughs> think that was very harmful but we're learning that that is more likely the kind of the, the the rays of light that actually cause pigmentation and can cause some harm unfortunately we don't have that many brands yet that are coming out with the visible light sun protection but there are there are a few i mean I think hats are great because I generally think hats or clothing are the best. Sunscreen's great, but I think that hats and clothing are, they're hundred percent sun protective and you don't have to worry about reapplying them. I know you want to go swimming right. and you want to go on the beach, but um, if you can do a hat, it shields your scalp, it shields your face. It gives you shade for your ears, your neck, if you wear a wide brim hat. So that's, I'm, I'm almost never outside without one. And that's just, uh, it's a good habit to get into. It's like, you know, you tell a lung doctor, how do you protect your lungs? They say, don't smoke. You tell a skin doctor, we say, wear hats, wear clothing, stay out of the sun. It is true. It's important to get vitamin D. Um, first off, you can get vitamin D through diet. Um, but yeah, what I generally say is if, you, if you're exposed to the sun for just your arms for 15 minutes twice a week, that's actually enough to saturate your vitamin D receptors to get enough vitamin D. So just walking around to the store and back really twice a week is more than enough on, on your arms or on your, your legs if you're wearing shorts. That's really actually enough vitamin D. You don't have to cook yourself outside in the beach for an hour to get vitamin D. You just have to get a very moderate amount, very modest amount of sun to get your vitamin D. But that, that is a, it's a tricky question and it's, there's always controversies about it. But yes, you do want to get some vitamin D. Um, sunscreens usually allow vitamin D to help, but, um, mm -hmm. to happen inside, but not as much. You're right. And you're right. Clothing will protect. If you're, if you're living in a bubble, you're not going to get any vitamin D. So you have to get it through diet or pills. There's a lot of people take supplements as well. Flat, flat pigmentation. We can usually help with bleaching creams and some other topical agents. The actual little scars, the little roughness, the little indentations is more difficult. And you usually have to do something cosmetic with either a laser resurfacing or, you know, a chemical peel. They're a little harder. And, you know, people that have bad acne scars, that, that's a tough, that's a tough problem. Dr. Fredson, would you talk to us just a little bit about maybe, um, are there some foods that are, um, that support skin health, maybe more so than others? There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, I guess, uh, papers and, and, and uh, ink written on skin health and specific diet, but they mostly contradict each other. What it, what it really comes down to, and I think when you look at me, I was just in a meeting in Boston where I went to a lecture on this, 
And what it really comes down to is uh, e e you want to eat healthy in general. And the healthy in general, your skin reflects your internal health. So what's it? What do we call? What do I call a healthy diet? Um, it's it's mostly plants. You know, some meat, mostly plants, uh, and mostly real food. Less processed, less you know, less uh, less high sugars like Coca Cola and you know. But you know, I, I don't know. I I think everything has to be again in moderation. I'm not going to put anybody in a gluten free vegan diet because most people won't stick with it and it's too hard. It's not necessarily healthier. So I think a healthy diet. Well, uh, what I say is eat real food, not too much. So don't overeat and mostly plants. And I think that's, that I think is the, is the best way to go. If you watch any amount of social media, YouTube videos, Instagram, um, people are kind of obsessing with skincare routines. Um, can you just tell us your recommendations in terms of things that we should absolutely use in terms of like, you see serums and all these different things. What items should absolutely be in our skincare routine and what items should absolutely not be in our skincare routine? So the first thing is these people that are influencers are paid to, to, to sell things. And I say, it's a funny story. I have twins that are 14 and I brought home some acne medicine for my boy and I gave it to him and his sister, his twin sister said to him, that's the wrong stuff. I've got better stuff I saw on Instagram. And, and I looked at her and I said, I don't know your pop culture and I don't know your songs. I don't know Zendaya, all these people you talk about, but I know skin. <laughs> and the, the, what I'm giving you is, is, is so don't, don't start buying things on social media without doing the right research. Don't just trust people that are selling things. Um, so the answer to your question, I think, again, is what I sort of harping on, which is you definitely should use sunscreen if you're outside. Um, you definitely should use a good moisturizer. Like the companies I usually sell are the ones I showed pictures of Cetaphil, CeraVe, Eucerin, um, uh, what else? Aveeno is a good product, Neutrogena, companies that have a good history behind them. Um, Gold Bond is actually a good company. There are a lot of them, ones that don't dry your skin out. You know, some people like to use Dial soap and Dial's got its place, but it's really not a, it's not a moisturizer. It's going to dry you out. Um, so that, to answer your question, what do I definitely recommend for everybody? a good emollient like those companies, a good cleanser and sunscreen. And are there any products that you are aware of that cause more harm than good that we should avoid? Um, okay, good, good question. So there are some topical bleaching creams which people will buy and they'll over apply to themselves and they'll over pigment or over, or over bleach their skins and they can get contact dermatitis. There's a lot of um, healing creams people sell um, Benadryl cream and Neosporin, which is up to five or 10% of the population is actually allergic to Neosporin. And they get a, a wound, they put Neosporin on it, and they say, this wound won't heal, the wound won't heal. And you look at it and say, no, the wound won't heal, but you're allergic to the Neosporin. So certain products over the counter, a lot of times I'll tell people, do a, do a test. Take a little bit, put it on your, your inside of your arm. So the bend of your arm, that's a very sensitive area. You put a little bit there, and if you can do it overnight without breaking out, it'll be good on your face too. That's a great point. I have um, been diagnosed with lupus, as you know, and uh, one of those things, Neosporin is not good for me. Um, are there certain things that impact people with chronic autoimmune illness in ways that they don't necessarily affect other people? Well, the main thing, as you know, with lupus is sun sensitivity. So I didn't really talk about that in my little talk and that certain conditions make you much more prone to sunburn and, and changes from the sun and skin cancer. Lupus is like, for some reason, no one really understands it. For some reason, lupus makes you super sensitive. So, right, I guess in your case, I would not do a sunscreen 15. I'd probably do 30 or 50 or even a 70 if you had it. And definitely hats, suns, you know, hats and, and clothing. If you're outside, especially between the hours of 10 and two, you wanna be covered up. Because sometimes they're a little bit thicker, but that thicker cream is actually gonna in the long run Preserve your skin and preserve your health. My recommendation is most people can tolerate a gentle facial cleanser, whether it's a liquid or a bar. Um, some people they have very, very sensitive facial skin and they would rather use, um, uh, you know, use a body cleanser, just, just let water clean their face. I, I would say almost everyone though can tolerate a, a facial cleanser. They make facial cleansers, which are really soft 
and do not sort of, uh, you know, desquamate or peel off the outer layer of the skin. You, that's what you want. So yeah, I, you're right. You people, and again, there's no, there's a lot of science behind all this, but there's a lot of people that are not aware of the science who want to make money by telling people, no, you don't want to wash your face or you want to buy my product because you put it on dry skin without wash. So you got to be a little skeptical of, of these products that aren't studied or just you know, sold on social media. And most people should wash their face. Most people can use a regular cleanser for the body and the face, but you'll see there are a lot of breakdowns of facial and non-facial. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I use Dove moisturizing soap, a bar on my face and my body when I shower. And I've done it for years. And I do, I do think a good moisturizing soap is a good way, especially for, I'll be honest with you, men are terrible at putting emollients on, okay? Men don't do it. I don't put goop on my skin. I mean, I'll do a little bit, but in general, women are, will get out of the shower and they'll put three layers of cream on and men will maybe spray something on, maybe. So if you can find something which is moisturizing in the shower, like a moisturizing cleanser or bar, I think that's a good, a good way to go. So this is one of those areas where it's okay to do what just works. As long and as it's not it. causing you to get worse, correct. Yeah. As long as okay. it's not causing you to dry out. Because the angle of the sun is just much more um, severe. So if you're outside, like especially in the summer, the days are long, you know, the, it'll get sunny at eight in the morning and be dark and sunny until 8 p.m. And after, after two or 3 p.m., there's still sun, it's still warm, but it's not gonna be the same danger of the angle. So I tell people, if you're going to the beach, you're going on vacation, you know, have a nice long lunch in the mall from 10 to two, and then go on the beach. It's still warm, it's still sunny, but you, it's, it's more safe for your skin. There's less ultraviolet rays penetrating because the angle of the sun is such that it's, it's, it's not right above your head. Uh, skin tags are a little, you know, floppy, Floppy tags, people get in the armpits and the eyelids around the neck. They're mostly signs of getting older. Um, they're harmless. They're not a sign of anything. Years ago, 30, 40 years ago, people thought maybe they were a sign of diabetes, but it turns out they're not. They're just, they just run in families. They're genetic. We see them over and over again. I don't remove them unless they cause pain or discomfort. So if someone comes in and says, I'm catching the, I shave my armpits and I'm catching my skin tags or it's catching on my my collar and my shirt. Then I'll remove them. They're easy to remove. Um, but I, there's no medical necessity to removing skin tags if they're just those classic floppy um, little pieces of skin on your neck or, or um, eyelids. Or, or sometimes the inner thighs, too. Inner thighs go up. Medications that make you more sensitive to the sun, they call photosensitizing medicines. And it really is the same thing as what Allison said earlier with lupus. Lupus is an is a autoimmune disease that makes you sensitive to the sun. Certain medicines do the same thing to your skin. For whatever reason, they get into the skin and the sun uh, reacts as if it was burning you much quicker. Uh, I wouldn't, so again, I would give you the same advice, which is sunscreen, hats, clothing, avoid the sun in the middle of the day. I, I think if you have multiple medicines that say photosensitizing, I think it's reasonable to talk to your doctor about you know, trying to minimize how many are on. Um, on the other hand, there are some medicines which say don't go in the sun, but they're just covering, the pharmacy's just covering their butt and they put on everything. There are certain oh. known medicines that cause photosensitivity, but some don't. Uh, microneedling is a technique used to help sort of rejuvenate the skin. I, I don't do it, but there, but there are estheticians in my office that do do it. Um, any any way of sort of peeling out the outer layer of the skin or allowing uh, sort of a freer blood flow, which is what microneedling does, sort of it convinces the skin to get sort of rejuvenated. So you get increased growth of the collagen under the skin. You get increased sort of uh, less finer lines. It's a way of making the skin look healthier. Um, we offer it. I honestly, I mean, I've personally never done anything like it. I've seen patients that have gone through it. It seems to hurt a little bit for some people, it's, but people also really uh, like the option if they're the right person. Certainly not a requirement. Um, I would take the advice of an esthetician, someone who's, who works in the field of aesthetics and does microneedling, because often it's best in combination with the right products, the right okay. retinoid, the right vitamin A, the right you know um, growth, growth serum, things like that. What do serums do? 
Uh, different serums have different purposes, but there's vitamin C serum. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. So if they if they develop it right, it gets in the skin and it it breaks down. Um, you know, ox oxygen can destroy things when it gets oxidized. So these break they stop the process of aging through breaking down this this antioxidant chemical uh, interaction. There's other serums, growth serums, which are derived sometimes from plants, sometimes from, from you know, scientific models and, and sort of skin that's grown in the culture. And there are molecules that, um, there are serums that sort of help rejuvenate the skin, again, from increasing uh, collagen growth and deeper um, uh, deeper substances. Again, unfortunately, Allison, I'm not, I'm not a cosmetic expert. I know the basics. Um, they're good, they're good questions, and they have a lot of amazing science-based products that have come out in the last 10 years. Um, uh, but the serums are just one way of getting these science-based products into your skin and trying to get some rejuvenation. Does the time in the sun or the number on the sunscreen change if you're on vacation in a place that is closer to the equator? So the closer, the, around, the, closer to the equator, the more, st more steep the rays are. So you want the highest the number you can get. Um, and the, that 10 to 2 number is probably going to be more like, you know, uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Because uh, the, 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 the rays of the sun, are much, that angle I was mentioning is much stricter when you're in the, by the equator. So, yeah, if you're going to Ecuador or somewhere like that, I would definitely, you know, I was in Ecuador at a medical mission four years ago. And everyone there had big hats, even the, and the people that live there and they're natives, they're still big hats, long sleeves. They keep covered up to protect themselves. I mean, hormones are always playing a role. Hormones change, you know, they, they change when you go through puberty, they change when you go through menopause and everyone's hormones affect everyone a little bit differently because you can have some people have the exact same hormone level in their blood, but some people get, you know, pigment and acne and some people don't. So it's, it's a combination of genetic factors um, and, and you know, plus obviously hormone supplements. Some people take birth control pills that can, make, that can affect your hormone levels or does affect your hormone levels. Um, but I, 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 there's not a, there's not a one answer for that question. It's, it's all individualized, and you know, a lot of times families, you know, where mom has this side of mom has this uh, effect, their daughters or their sons will have that effect too. If they're blisters from sitting in the same place, then obviously you got to buy the special, you know, cushions that are that that they use like in hospitals where they where they keep you from having pressure on the same area because sometimes pressure in the same area can cause blisters but there's also skin diseases that especially comes with chronic illness that causes an autoimmune disease against your skin and you form blisters and that's a whole different discussion so i can't definitely if, if you know the blisters are coming in areas of friction you got to just minimize the friction you know you can wrap your legs gently put vaseline on and wrap them with some you know some gauze and make a barrier but you just have to have the softest uh, movable product that your knees are on. I feel like everyone has made wonderful use of this time. So thank you all for bringing your questions. And for those who didn't ask questions, I feel like you were furiously scribbling notes. <laughs> uh, and, and I hope that you mm -hmm. will follow up with your own primary care doctor or your dermatologist. Again, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing so much You're wonderful welcome. information uh, that right. I'm sure we're going to put to use uh, almost immediately. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to gather and to, to gain such great insights and great information about how best to manage our skincare, how it interacts with the things that we're already dealing with, and a way forward, Lord, that can help us protect our skin and uh, thereby protecting our overall health as well. So I thank you for Dr. Fretzen. Thank you for everyone that was able to come to this workshop, and thank you for everyone who will watch at a later date. Thank you for all the things that you're doing in our lives. I pray, Lord, that we will be able to apply this information so that we can be at our best for you and for your kingdom. We pray these and all blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.